please use the hashtag PW20 or PW online. So the topic today, or oh, right now, two years of GDPR, what has changed? So we are now having a lawyer as a speaker with a very complicated title. So if you know it, the GGG. And that's a society where they, you find a lot of forms and uh, helps, helps with formulating for small corporation, uh, for small companies, bigger companies. And of course, her webpage, and she'll be happy if you follow her on Twitter. She is Corolla underscore ceiling. Very welcome. Hello. Thank you for taking the time. We are looking forward to it. Tomorrow, it's exactly 888 days since the GDPR took effect in the EU. So two years, five months, three days. It was, of course, shown um, 3,200 days ago. So, but basically it builds on rules that mostly based on ideas and concepts that are from the last century. So 20 years old, so about data security, data privacy and all that. It be, it was it gained some uh, renewability, of course, because of the big penalties, all the fees that were quoted. Yeah. So did that actually happen? Yeah. Why don't we read about it? No. Was it that effective then at all? Was it necessary or did it help? Yeah. So that's what we will be talking about the next time, a few minutes. And we will have time for questions in the chat. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. And for my thank you from my side as well. I'm very pleased to be able to be here. That means I'm just in front of Max Shrimps. I, he's going to be after me. It's, I'm very honored. Oh, yeah. GDPR. That's exactly the point. Two years. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Thanks for doing the math. 888 days. And since when do we know that? And from practice, let me, let me throw in some figures from practice. As we see it in an everyday work, as we live it day to day. But actually, it was, came quite surprising. If when I remember back a little bit, I was thinking, um, even the authorities weren't ready. The regulation authorities weren't ready. We knew, we knew we'd have to report um, the data protection, and every certain conditions where you have to have your own referent. Uh, blah blah and this in, in GDPR and then also in national law and maybe local laws are stronger and 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 we said and we said hey we listen we know that GDPR is coming so we went to the authorities and said uh, we'll we'll send well, well send them an email and this is our this is our representative. And I can remember and, and and they said, "Yeah, you have to come back in three months we 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 cannot deal with that yet uh actually, they just threw it away. Now, now there is this this lawful implication that, but, but 
No, even the, the, the authorities, it says, weren't prepared, weren't ready. There was no information available. Um, when we started, uh, when, when we were looking, because in Germany, uh, the lender set up the, the, the differentiated rules and how we looked all over the place, where are the information to gather? Uh, yeah, you know, people who don't live in Germany, we notice, especially at Corona, we live in this federalistic state. Sometimes this has advantages and sometimes it doesn't. As far as data protection is, it's rather bothersome because the data protection authority is, it, there's one for every land, there's one for Berlin and one for Hamburg and one for Bavaria. Actually, in Bavaria, they have two, one for the private sector and one for the public sector. In other countries, uh, in other Bundesländer, um, there's one point. It's easier in Austria, although um, we're also a federal state, but we only have one authority. Oh, last week a paper from uh, from the authority uh, up to, to Microsoft 365 and said that is not GTBR conform, you can't use it. And eight have voted against it and nine have voted before for it. And it, it, it you get so that you get a sort of a, a mishmash of different opinions. Um Actually, we then went when the GDPR came into vigor, uh, and then, then we said, "Now we would like to report our representative." And they wrote back, "Oh, now there'll be an online tool." And that online tool was on twenty fifth May, wasn't there? On the twenty eighth of May, and on the first of July. And now we said, "Now um, you have to pay a fine." I mean, we have to pay a fine because we haven't reported our representative, and we looked into other lender, and 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 we found out if everybody does it a different way. And some said, "Oh, you could email that," and some said, "You could post that." And in North Rhine Westphalia, uh, they finally made it. Um, sent out a paper saying no, you don't have to report them if, if the law says so, but we can't report it. Wait until we finished, um, and then you don't also have to pay fines because I can't report it and I can't, so I don't have to pay a fine. A, a bit, bit of a big. That was how it started. How does it feel today? We had the first evaluation of the European Commission in June. Um, there was this uh, obligation to reevaluate after two years how helpful was GDPR, uh, how good were we at it, what went wrong, and next year it'll happen again. It, uh, and then in four years, in four years, rhythm, they'll have this. Re and I have the impression that everybody stands around clapping each other's, slapping each other's back, and congratulating. And many things have moved to the positive way, but especially to small and medium em en entities, um, it's very difficult. Also, this this need to document everything uh, seems very complicated. Um, also, in the evaluation, how sensible are the data? Uh, is that very sensible or not sensible? When it's which party are you in? Are you part of a union? What sex do you want to see yourself in? That has to be specially protected. 
And th then you have to build a huge management system for your data, and you're basically only a one-man firm. Um, and the authorities have done very little to help. What lacked also, yeah, we lawyers, yeah, yeah, we, we like to, we German lawyers tend to, uh, there is this law in Germany uh, that when somebody does something unlawful, you can write him and ask him to stop doing it. And this is very costly. F and this is a typical German thing. And we, a lot of lawyers specialize and make a living of it. Um, this hasn't come, and the authorities are a bit better. They have coordinated better. I also got the feeling that 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 there was a sort of a, a grace period. Uh, at the beginning, when you read this evaluation, this this a slapping your back thing that came out in June. Sixty one percent of all citizens uh, in Europe uh, know about GDPR. I think that's not very great. I, for instance, started a lot. Uh, I, I was very interested, and I started in 2007 doing my first data protection Yeah, so back then people thought, yeah, that's the CEO does that, and we don't have to protect our um, our workers' data. But that changed, and especially after Snowden, there was a big change. And since the GDPR, we have to say, there really was a big change in the economy and in the with the companies to really work with data protection. And it's basically not what you would wish or would want in all the details. But I have to say, thinking of Japan, where they basically copied the GDPR, a lot of states really, or a lot of countries really like the idea. And there are a lot of instruments that you can just take and use. And I would say that for data... Um, data protection, it was a good step. And even back then, I would say that in Germany, I don't know if there was a similar law in Austria, but since 2010, there was something like that in Germany. So back then, you couldn't really talk to companies about that but since the gdpr is there yeah they know yeah we have to we have to have a contract for the data even with our uh, contractors and the contracts and how the networks of contracts that that improved since the gdpr and you are really thinking about who is working for me and who am i using a subcontractor and recently i had something on my table where or on my desk where the question was with a phone robot who should manage incoming uh, phone calls. But of course, there was a nice software and a very nice uh, AI with a seat in Europe, and the contract was OK, and the technological and organizational uh, properties were OK. Definitely for a startup, but now there was a Google tool in there again. And of course it was in there. And yeah, we need the database for this and that. But yeah, that is a problem now. Because now we have to see how we can manage that. 
And it has to be said, couldn't we work without that tool? Aren't there some options? And before, nobody would have cared. It wouldn't have become obvious. And that, yeah, that self-congratulation, congratulating, I wouldn't have done it like that because they also noticed a lot of things that could be improved in the organization of things. But they were also people who are very unhappy with uh, offices from all over Europe who said it's not enough. It's not taking it far enough, especially internationally. It's always difficult. We can't get to a decision and locally it's easy to make a decision. But as soon as there are other offices involved, it's a very long procedure and we never get anywhere. And I've heard that before from uh, in this uh, letter from the commission. And yeah, the fees that really had made high waves, for example, here in Hamburg, uh, where I'm talking from right now, there was this problem with H&M, a company, and the value of the problem was noted as 35 million euro. And they had a welcome back uh, talk with their employees. And after a holiday or something, they talked and yeah, how are you? How are the kids? How was everything? How did you manage your sickness? And all of that was documented in a system and saved. And the employees didn't know about that. And this procedures, the work with the data that all became public knowledge just recently, when all those data could be found publicly in the net. So there was a, a leakage of information of data. And so, yeah, the, this punishment happened and H&M accepted that and they probably wanted to avoid negative publicity. But you see some punishments happened and that also helps with other companies that awakens them to these issues and especially the bigger companies you don't actually want to punish the small handyman from next door if his um, data is online by accident you don't want to punish him too badly because he is a very small one or if he loses his data which is also a data breach you want to punish them for that you want to get the big ones and to punch in there heavily to have a big procedure and a big case and H&M is certainly one of the bigger ones and this was another interesting one now uh, relatively new British Airways and there was a hack of their data uh, of their site the attack was prepared with a contractor who had access who also needed the access to customer data and you can see over 400,000 customer data was breached, credit card data, names, addresses, security numbers. All of that was not uh, encrypted or protected well enough and was accessible to the attackers. And before that, they said last year this was discovered And it was openly accessible via the net for quite a long time, actually, before it was discovered. And the office in the UK then said that so much and so long that will be real money. And originally it was about 200 million euro that they were supposed to pay. And now they are 20 million pound which is about $22 million. So they really peddled back. And I really looked at the argumentation. Why did they scale it down so much? That can't just be because of Corona. Well, of course, the companies are struggling because of the crisis, also financially. But here, one of the reasons was that they said 
the main fault was not with the company, with British Airways, because apparently they also included um, who who is at fault. And at least according to the press, there was like 4 million less because of Corona. And then also British Airways cooperated quite well. And that could be seen if you, the companies cooperate. Uh, well, the cooperation with the responsible offices is quite well. They are not repressive as, as repressive as you might imagine. There are a lot of warnings because before there is a penalty. But you also have to see that such a penalty is also there to be a deterrent and also to change something. And you can see if you don't have a penalty for not wearing a mask, many people just don't wear a mask. So sometimes you need a repressive penalties and the same thing for data protection. I can see the same thing with many companies. Many of them, they want to do many things right and they try to do it right and to have a good image. And the bigger the company is, the more they try to calculate what's the risk. Can we risk it? What's the benefit if we do it differently? And that's why I really think it's a good idea that there are bigger punishments. And I mean, 20 million pounds, it's, it's a bigger number. So yeah, how do you actually calculate such a penalty? The GDPR um, dictates that the office can use their own discretion. So the uh, the amount is topped out by the four by four percent of the worldwide um, yeah the money uh, worldwide money they are handling and. I also find this is a good idea. So there is this very small entity. They don't have very much money, but also bigger companies, they only have a few hundred dollars that can't work. So I really like that they consider how much money they make worldwide. And here in Germany, there is also a list of uh, penalties. There are websites where you can Calculate your own penalty as a company. What will it cost if I do something wrong? And there you can see how much money did I make last year? And then you can say, is it a bad case or a, an easy case? And then you have how much it costs per day. And then you can calculate that on a year. And then you can calculate how much your penalty would be. But yeah, we are unsure if that can be handled that way long term. And yeah, I had a look, but the EU Commission does not really know about the penalties. The numbers you can find, and I brought a few more of those, you have to say those are private companies. They really ask themselves there is no uh, proper system and it would be nice to know how many penalties were there and what happened what accidents did happen and many people don't even tell the eu commission you have no idea and there is uh, how much there was and there's also it doesn't have to be mentioned and sometimes we also want to look, where are we compared to other countries and how high is the risk? And that would also be important for seeing if it worked and it, if it helped and also how secure is our data in the EU. But unfortunately, you can find anything about this. There is a paper called GDPR in Numbers. That was after the first six months. 
the commission started this based on European data, com um, data protection commission based on the first few numbers. And it says data point of May 2019 and there's nothing more new. And if you look for that, it's interesting what other people are Googling and how often they Google GDPR and nice numbers about that. But I picked out something after the first birthday. The slide is called Happy Birthday GDPR. And you can see the reach was rather high. So many people are well aware of it, but I wanted to look at these numbers. There are two things to look at. So first, the complaint. If someone handles my data and can have that checked out. So yeah, if there is, for example, a camera in your house, you can ask the office, the government agency, is that okay? And then they will check it out. So there is this complaint option and you can see after one year, there were 144,000 complaints that they registered. That is in the whole of the EU, but that's still a lot. And then there is the self obligation of the companies to really uh, call out the data problems. And a lot of companies actually use that option. So after one year, about 90,000 people who called the, the agency and mentioned, yeah, we had a breach. And I looked for Austria and the Aust Austrian agency, data security agency, they had a small two digit number of um, employees or people working there and they have to handle all the complaints and all the notifications. And I honestly see a mismanagement. That's not enough people working on that. I also wonder, is it well done? Are the methods properly um, allocated? But the, so should companies do it like that? But these numbers show that many people are unhappy with the situation. And there was a study, what kind of data work were the complaints about? And most of it was about phone marketing and video surveillance, stuff like that. And as a company, I really should think about, should I do it like this? And maybe do something uh, to stop the complaints from coming improve the situation. And I have another list here and I always try to, I always included the uh, sources and this is from a big agency um, of lawyers. And in the beginning of the year, they made a small study and they looked how many notifications from companies came from which country and a lot came from the Netherlands and from De Germany. So Austria was 1,644 notifications from companies that called out the agency and said something happened. So what happens if you don't give a notification? Yeah, so did the companies really do that? But this high number tells us that they probably do give notifications. And that's the feedback coming from the companies. But on the other side, we can see that, well, if I don't give a notification, that also warrants a penalty. So if someone complains about me not giving a notification or an employee is not happy and is a whistleblower, then there will be a penalty for the 
for not giving a notification or not giving it in time. And then obviously for the accident as well. So of course, this method or this tool is very important, but who, who can handle all that? So back then something else existed, but that was also only about specific data, for example, credit card information, and that had to be no, uh, call, um, cause a notification. But now pretty much every data breach has to be um, has to cause an information and people have to calculate the risk involved. And now here we can see what kind of sums we are talking about. 2018, you see, well, there's nothing, but that's obvious because all the uh, agencies had to find their bearings first. And then 2019, it started. And that also began in the different countries at different times. And all in all, we really get several good numbers. So we are talking about uh, millions of heroes here. But the number of penalties is not that high. Right now we are, are about 400 pen penalties, but it has to be said that not all of them are in there because not all the agency in all the countries release the data digitally. Or at least not all of them are included here equally because they don't have to public uh, to publicly quote their data and so they don't some of them but when we look about that and we think that pretty much every company had a data breach at some point then this is not much so in austria there were seven of these 400 so seven cases and I think you all know this, that the Austrian mail service, the post office, that was a big one. Then there was a small one for a, a restaurant. And I think that penalty was in, there was a two digit penalty for Google, I think in Hungary or something. So I think it should be mostly about the more drastic problems. And yeah, I think the problem here with the mail office was that it wasn't clear what the data was used for. Yeah, and this is now the text of the law. Please don't read that. And so yeah, what, what does it mean, a data breach? Whenever something does not happen as it ha should have, I have a small list, so maybe a hacker attack, but maybe just losing a USB stick. There is people still using those or uh, giving data that was happening unwillingly even just losing a power a power outage can be a data breach because it's not available at the time and yeah so now you have to give a notice that's uh yeah so gdpr pushes you to give notice and you have to give notice to the agency you have to give notice to the people who are affected and there are three stages small risk middle risk and high risk or risk and high risk and in the red you have to notify the offended people and in yellow and red you have to call the agency so i would have done that the other way around but yeah so the agency can then decide should the affected people even be called or informed and usually the afflicted people have strong strong rights but with data breaches i've I find it kind of sad that it's this way, but yeah, the risks are also included. So what could it cost in financially? 
And yeah, I have to do it as quickly as possible. Now I can just run through the last few slides. And that's the last point. What what follows? Um, so yeah, what is the punishment, but also how can I undo the so yeah how can i undo the damage i've done and there are some numbers now coming out if what happens if i publicized someone's party affiliation and there that's a three digit number at least and i could talk about a lot but yeah i shouldn't take a lot of time because there is a delay and after me there's the prominent people the vip is coming so maybe for me the main point is to, that the gdpr is a good beginning and it helped a lot and now data protection becomes a topic because of the high penalties but in the reality there are still some areas that need, could be improved yeah awesome the problem is we really have so little time for this topic. I could listen for hours. I myself have about this many questions. But yeah, unfortunately, we are low on time. But you are here for questions in the break area. That's awesome. Thank you very much for taking the time. I hope everything worked out for you and it was fun. Yeah, it was amazing. Thanks for the invite.